Thank you so much indeed. I appreciate the problem you have right now with time. Kick me down after 10 minutes. I'll not talk more than that. 1980, I made a prognosis, which was based on theory and based on quite intimate knowledge of what was happening, that the Berlin Wall would fall within 10 years and would be followed by the fall of the Soviet Empire. I saw the Berlin Wall as the weakest point in the Soviet construction. It fell two months ahead of time. How could I do that? How could I say that? Well, there is something called holistic and dialectic thinking and a search for equity. Those three words are key. If you go to US intellectualism, you will find no holism, no dialectics. And if you look up equity under an index in a book, you will see C mortgages. <laughs> now, there is a point here which is important because some of the words I now have been quoting come from the Orient that do not come from the Occident. My own experience is that I had to travel east to understand more about peace and south. I'm deeply impressed with the African civilization. Deeply impressed, very much underestimated. I'm deeply impressed with what is happening in Latin America. I think three basic things are happening in the world now. Point one, the fall of the US empire. Point two, the decline of the West. Point three, a new category added to the old ones, less developed countries, LDC, more developed countries, MDC, presided over by Washington, DC. <laughs> and the new category is the developing countries, headed as usual by Anglo-America. Watch what's happening. Let me go a little bit more into detail. The US imperial fall, I would give it at most till 2020, means four concrete things. And they're all to the advantage of the US itself and the world. Point one, militarily, stop killing. Not demanding disarmament. What should be demanded is conflict resolution. Sit down with the party, even if you don't like him, and try to find out what he wants. I'm shuttling between Afghanistan and Washington myself. It's a tough job. Point two, politically. Stop twisting arms, stop threatening. Negotiation. Put the cards on the table. Have a look at all the arguments. You have good arguments sometimes, Washington. You don't have to do that arms twisting and threatening. Point three, the most difficult one to start with. Instead of believing that you have all the answers, civilizational dialogue, there is more than one civilization in the world. The West has a lot of good things to offer. So does the Islamic civilization, Buddhist civilization, Japanese, Chinese, African civilization. Dialogues on equal terms. And the last point, almost impossible for the US, due to the heavy influence of US economists. Try to understand what equitable deals means. It means when you run down the pyramid that have made deals, that you don't only count willing buyer, willing seller signing a document, you count the effects down to the last. It's tough, it's difficult, it's not an economic theory. Any economist unable to predict what, September, what happened in September 2008 should voluntarily simply demand that he's retired. That would get rid of almost all of them except eight. <laughs> we would get rid of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank since they did not predict it, which would be all to our advantage. Instead, we got the catastrophic bailout instead of stimulus. Let us say 90-10, it should be 10-90. And you got all the European indebtedness. 
mainly due to that. It's not due to the welfare state. It's due to the money they put into the stupid deal after September 2008 and cut it by the monetary fund. So having said that, I just want to add one thing. The state system itself is in decline. What is coming is the regional system. It's very big. It consists of European Union, the African Union, where I could add quite a lot of even more complementary things than the marvelous talk from the former president of Mozambique. It is, of course, the South Asian, the Southeast Asian, all of them with important contributions, and the three coming ones, the United States of Latin America and the Caribbean. It will take some time. It starts in the Andean, and it also started in a small island in the Caribbean, and they have suffered a lot for being the first. They have made mistakes, some of them admitted by the boss himself. They have a lot to learn, but they were the first. Now, having said that, there is a third next one coming. It's the Islamic community. From Morocco to southern Philippines, 57 countries, 1,560 million. They're not going to ask Washington for permission. They're not even going to ask Brussels for permission. And if they want a caliphate, they have as much right to have that as Catholics of the world, who are about the same numbers, a little bit less, have to have a Vatican. If you want to deny them one, then deny the other two. We have to remember here that some of these countries have been operating under the idea of having a divine mandate. Today there are only two left, United States and Israel. Israel's cynical use of the Judaic idea of chosen people and chosen land, promised land, and its aping in 1620 by the pilgrims who went and founded the colony has been a disaster. It has to go. It has to be challenged by other civilizations. Now, the state system's demise will not affect the biggest ones not China, Russia, India, perhaps US, although US is relatively small relative to the other ones in size and population. Maybe Mexico, United States, Canada, Mexico scan could be interesting, a North American combination with wonderful people, much talent, much generosity and universalism, as long as the idea of running the world is given up. After 244 military interventions, starting in 1805 with Thomas Jefferson, 74 after the Second World War, some of them are going on, and you can judge their success right now. Now, three words are standing here. They want to say something about them. The first word is peace building. If there is a rule in peace building, I think nobody has said it better than Zhuan Lai and Jawaharlal Nehru. In the Panchila, in the 1954 prolegomenon to the Bandung Conference, cooperation for mutual and equal benefit. And equal. And equal. Capitalism has some mutual benefit built into it, but it never had equal. You have to add other measures to make it equal, to make it equitable. Some of the measures are known, some of them are still to be found. And here comes the problem. In my experience, the West understands mutual, but has never understood equal. They always want an edge over the rest. Always want that little extra, be it military, economic, politically, or cultural, or by cloning, by cloning, by inducing the countries to accept their cultural genes through technical assistance, out of a conviction that their civilization is higher than all the others. Has to go. The distance from clone to clown is not only phonetically short. <laughs> now, when it comes to reconciliation, there is a very basic experience, which I think many people have made. 
In my own book, uh, 50 Years, 100 Peace and Conflict Perspectives uh, out there, there are 10 experiences with reconciliation. And the experience is this. Reconciliation before solution of the underlying conflict is called pacification. Lollipop politics. To talk about reconciliation in today's Iraq, Afghanistan is ridiculous. It's an insult to human intelligence. Nothing has been solved. I can go further. The only thing that has been solved in former Yugoslavia is Slovenia. The only thing. Don't take that word in vain. And yet it was tremendously important in South Africa because it came after the solution, which was one person, one vote. I still remember the TV team from Western Europe that came to South Africa and was waiting, fighting between black and black. Didn't take place. And they went back saying, nothing is happening here. <laughs> it was only democracy. It was the whole thing. That tells a little bit about media and their psychopathic longing for something negative. If media could learn to watch out for the positive, they could be an inspiration instead of contributing to apathy and pessimism. So having said that, reconciliation presupposes solution. Germany was accepted into the European community. As of 1st of January 1958, reconciliation came 10 years later. It came with brilliant German leadership, to a large extent by Gustav Heinemann, reworking the textbooks. It was a totally different formula from the South African ones. There are many such formulas that can be put to use, but the solution was a condition. There is, of course, a solution to Israel Middle East. Repeat 1958. If two or three Arab leaders could stand up and say, we invite Israel to join us in the Middle East community, by Israel, we mean 1967 borders. We invite all countries in the world to recognize a Palestine with those borders. We might consider downgrading diplomatic relations to an Israel who does not accept this and upgrading a Palestine. Israel, please consider things like this. They are quite reasonable. You can get security through peace. You will never get peace through security the way you pursue it. Learn from Germany. I know that that's the most popular phrase I can tell in Israel, learn from Germany. But there is another Germany. Learn from it. Last point, globalization. Nothing new. Has been pointed out by so many who know their history. We had a brilliant globalization from 500 to 1500. It was called the Silk Road, which is a totally wrong name. It was about much more than silk, and it was not a road. It was essentially by ship. That's the reason why it's called the Silk Road. Now, try to travel that road, and you'll have some difficulties. Try to go by ship. It went from eastern China to the major country in Africa at the time, Somalia. Every Somali school child knows his past. He also knows who ended it. Western colonialism of the most brutal kind. The Portuguese to start with, followed up by the whole rest of the gang. That gang, 11 of them, have a union called the European Union. But I'm quite willing to say that some changes have been observed. Although I also agree with the remark that was made that if one of them makes a deal, even a little intervention in his former part, he assumes the others to shut up, on the condition that I shut up and you do the same. It's called gentleman's agreement. It's also called a club of mafiosi. <laughs> but if you look at this kind of situation, there is a model. There are positive things. I agree with those who say that the war is, practically speaking, unthinkable. That is an achievement. That achievement should be celebrated. It should be brought to Israel 
and the Middle East. Now, with the state system going down, you will not expect people to give their lives for states. That's the major reason why we have less wars among them. What is then coming up? Nations. 200 states, 194 members of the UN, 2,000 nations characterized by language, religion, a shared vision of history and the future, myths, and the geographical attachment, 2,000. The world manages that problem extremely badly. 19th century independence, maybe a solution for some. Generally, some kind of the 30, 40 major types of federalism would not be a bad solution. In other words, we have challenges. But the globalization could be a repetition of the Silk Road. How about building a four-lane highway through the Congo, from Dar es Salaam to the port of Kinshasa, with rails, of course? How about opening the south, 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 south trade? China, Southeast Asia, East Asia, Middle East, Africa, to Rio de Janeiro, to South America. How about making a side road to Somalia, to Cameroon, to the uh, Afrique Centrale? How about doing that? Having enormous amount of products and services, goods and services crossing all directions. Well, I made that suggestion, in all modesty, which is not my characteristic, actually, to the Foreign Policy Committee of the Central Committee of the CPC, the Communist Party of China, one month ago. In a sense, interesting that the peace researcher who was accused of being a communist, but not yet terrorist, strangely enough. <laughs> Somebody has forgotten, FAZ, where are you when we need you? Where are you? Uh, let me add a little footnote, FAZ. You had many bold people talking about DDR. Congratulations for that. I made a talk in DDR for the leadership blaming them for the invasion of Czechoslovakia and comparing it to the US invasion of Vietnam. And out came two Stasis clothed in black and carried me out to the limousine that they had mobilized outside. But they made a mistake. They hadn't seen that the microphone had a cable that was loose so that I could talk while they carried me. <laughs> and I said, ladies and gentlemen, as a farewell remark, it looks like I'm leaving. <laughs> the experience with all empires in the world, including the Soviet empire, is that sooner or later they go under. Thank you. That was my remark. <laughs>